So yeah, I'm an anthropologist. I worked for uh, more years than I want to count in Indonesia. And maybe 25 years ago, my world sort of changed because I spent, I went to the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems, and I told a story about which part of which you'll hear this morning. And uh, a, a, a physicist in the audience asked me whether the system that I described to him would self-organize, words which meant nothing to me at the time. But I went back and discovered that it would, and things changed for me. So what I'm going to try to do is give you two examples as we get the sound a little here, of, uh, taken from the islands where I work. But there are two meanings to this title. One is islands, looking at Bali and Borneo. But um, I also mean by this islands of low dimensional order. And all I mean by that is in the social sciences and the behavioral sciences, our mathematics, our analytical tools are built on the idea of perfect equilibrium, right? So which doesn't exist. It's a mathematical abstraction. So, in reality, what the world has, outside of physics, right, is islands of low dimensional order. Uh, I hope this is going to, I can't tell whether I'm, my sound is intelligible. Shall I just keep shouting? Or? <laughs> Shall I can speak and okay. um, Let me hook up both of them, see which one works. Okay. All right, so, right, so, So this is going to be a little bit of mathematics and a lot of reality. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm a, I'm a field guy, okay? So I'm going to talk about things we really find in the field. So the question, however, is what we really find in the field is much of the time the world is kind of in order, but from time to time, deep patterns actually change. So language A sometimes turns into language B. Things that are autonomous sometimes get networked. Stable things sometimes become transitory. And the question is, what happens under those circumstances, right? How does that actually work? So one model, borrowed straight out of nonlinear dynamics, which is where complexity comes from, right, is the notion that we, things stay low-dimensional order, means a manifold which is kind of staying more or less in the same, same place, but from time to time it may undergo movement, which ultimately meaning some change in its internal dynamics, which occasionally may lead to a transition like this, A becomes B. So the fundamental question is, how does that happen? Right? How do we do that? And I'm going to give you some examples of how that, we think, has happened. OK, so um, this is revolutionized. I teach both in anthropology and also in ecology. And this notion has revolutionized ecology. So right, so ecology, uh, ec ecological models were you know, had to do with equilibrium systems until recently. Then we discovered that actually the ecosystems are not in equilibrium. And so we've got examples of that. So, um, it turns out that there's some nice mathematics to show under what circumstances do ecosystems change when they move to an unstable point and move from one state to the next. Calling The jargon for that is now a tipping point. And the canonical example is shallow Dutch lakes. We have a Dutch uh, uh, avenue here. The problem in Holland was lakes were polluted, too much fertilizer um, runoff was creating turbid lakes, not only actually in the lakes, but in the, in the Baltic Sea. Reducing the fertilizer, lakes still remain turbid. So uh, a mathematical ecologist named Martin Sheffer said, well, maybe this is actually a nonlinear system. If it's nonlinear, he thought, he could try an experiment. And the experiment was remove the fish from the lakes. Take out the fish. That has several effects, allowing the zooplankton to recover, reducing the sediment loads. And then reducing the fertilizer allows the lake to turn back to its clear state. So you walk it back to a prior state and then move it forward. And in fact, that worked. So at least that's what I've told. I haven't been to the Holland to look, but I understand it actually worked. So he was rather celebrated. This, this, is a, this was an insight from nonlinear dynamics, a very straightforward one that actually had real world implications. But the, the thing is, lakes are actually pretty simple ecosystems. You can watch them as they're changing. You can measure the time series. You can measure the variables as you see them. Um, what about something like this? Here's a shallow lake. These are rice paddies on the Indonesian island of Bali. And this is intrinsically a coupled social ecological system. It's brought into existence by the labor of farmers. So there's social dynamics involved in maintaining this ecosystem, especially by hand. And there are also the dynamics of the natural ecosystem, you know, the stuff that grows in the paddy. So small scale, that's pretty intelligible. But here are 
Here's a region in Bali. Took centuries to build these rice terraces, <coughs> done by hand, requiring phenomenal levels of cooperation by the Malanese who built it. Let it go, and it will turn back into a muddy hillside in a matter of weeks, yet, it, yet it's centuries old. Imagine that the, you know, one, a single man's parcel will be about a third of a hectare, so just a fraction of that. Everybody's got to get along to make that system work. So do the Balinese have a special gene for cooperation? Are they just different from us, right? One possibility. Otherwise, the question is, how does this actually work? How does this co coupled social ecological system sustain itself? What makes it go? So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So very briefly, here's our volcanic island where monsoon rains falling on, the, on that landscape leach the minerals out. They flow into the irrigation systems and produce a kind of a continuous hydroponic system, you know, delivering those nutrients to the ecosystem. For that to work, however, Balinese farmers had to get the water from the bottom of the, of the streams. The same monsoon rains that are leaching out the minerals are flowing very fast down the slopes of the volcanoes, so that gives them a cutting edge, right? They slice channels down through the flanks of the volcano. So if you want to use that water for a rice paddy, you need to get it from the bottom of a ravine like that to, you know, to some terraced hillside downstream. So they've been building tunnels since 896 AD. That's our first reference in a Balinese royal inscription to irrigation tunnel builders. So they've been at it for a long time, constructing these tunnels. And uh, then from the 12th century, we have references to the organization that until now still maintains that system, who manages it. They're called Subak. Subak consists of all the farmers who obtain water from the same irrigation source. So there's their fields. And it is considered a religious system. They believe as Hindu Buddhists that you need to give thanks for the water that is the gift of the goddess that you know, makes your family grow. So the Subaks have networks of temples like these where farmers who obtain water from the same source go to thank the goddess and also to make their cropping decisions. When will they plant and what kind of rice will they plant? They, they, the practical management of this system is through channels of networked water temples. So the question is, how does that actually function? The Subaks take the water from these rivers and springs. Here you see a main canal diverging. There's a shrine for farmers from this Subak or the other Subak to come and give thanks to the water that irrigates their field. Okay? Pretty simple system. The, the shrines and water temples follow the hydrological patterns, the rivers exactly. It, it's, a, it's how they control the water system. And down they go, right? After they've collected that water, then they terrace the hillsides like that. The other thing they do with water that's interesting and less obvious is they use it to control the rice pests. So there are lots of things that like to eat the rice besides us. Insects, bacterial and viral diseases, rats, all of which can spread in the fields. It's a tropical environment. There's no winter so that those pest populations can build up very quickly. The way they're controlled by the traditional system is by synchronizing the harvest over a sufficiently large area so that the pests can't migrate from one field to the next, okay? So here you see a water temple in action. These fields three months ago would have been planted with rice. Recently they were harvested, they've now been flooded, nothing for the pests to eat, right? So that is an effective way to maintain control of the ecosystem using the channeling of water, the scheduling of irrigation. All right, but that requires cooperation. So it turns out that Subox vary in the degree to which they can sustain the cooperation necessary to make this thing work. And uh, I'm going to give you a quick example of the dynamics of cooperation. Here we have, along a river, eight Subox. There are actually about 30 on that river, but we chose eight to understand how well they work, you know, to look to compare the more successful ones with the less successful ones and see how the thing works. Okay, so it turns out that the upper Subox are more successful, this is just how successful they are in the estimate of the farmers themselves, how good is your subak at managing itself. The upstream guys think they're doing well, <laughs> the downstream guys are less confident. Failures of cooperation. Okay, so they rate their condition higher. We played something called the dictator game with these guys. In the dictator game, we give you, let's say you're a subak, we give everybody a day's wage and we say you can now give anonymously, you can share as much as you like of this. 
all of it, none of it, some fraction of it with the other guys in our subak. And it's one, we're all in a subak, right? So you've known each other forever. First, we have to make very sure that they, they're confident that it'll be secret, okay? And then they, they make their gift, okay? So here are the results. The lower subox, here are the offers. This is the fraction of how much of the day's wage they're giving away. And here is the result of the survey. What's the condition of my subak, right? Is it over here, it's very good, perfect. Down here, it's not so good. Okay, so here's a subak that is a pretty good condition relatively. It's the best condition of any of these, and they're the most generous. Down here, okay, the subak that, it's in the worst, that is in the worst shape, by their own estimate, is also the least generous. Those guys have basically given up, right? They're perfunctorily generous, but they're not really as invested as before. Now here are the upper subox, okay? Here they are, they're all more, well basically, game offers are higher, but notice who's the most generous. It's the one in the least good shape. So this is the subox that's in trouble, and they are adding to, they're more generous. They're doubling down, if you like. They are investing in the subox, which has got a problem. In that case, it's a problem with irrigation. Okay, so that was interesting. And actually, if we assumed an equilibrium situation, then those dynamics would be averaged out. We just take what is con conventionally done, just take the average and say, well, subox are this average. You know, the average generosity is the average of these values. But actually, we see two opposing dynamics going on in those different subox. Okay, so then we asked him a few more questions. The survey only took 20 minutes or so, a very simple instrument, like how effective are sanctions by my subak? This picture is kind of getting dated, but if you remember Dominic Strauss-Kahn, okay. All right, all right. So, so, uh, so the upstream guys are more confident in, this, in the efficacy of their sanctions than the low. This is the median and this is the range, right? You know that thing? So this is the average level, and that's everybody in the upstream Subox thinks their sanctions work just fine. Here's the performance of Subox rituals. How well is our Subox doing in terms of performing the necessary rituals? Once again, the upstream guys do better. Here's how good are we at collective labor. Once again, the upstream guys do better. You get the picture, right? However, here's an interesting fact. The proportion of landowners versus sharecroppers is identical, okay? It's the same, but the consequences are different. So, Average is identical, but the effects of whether, I mean, if you're a sharecropper, presumably you're less invested in a farm that you don't own, right? So what are the consequences of that, right? So here we are, and I don't know how clear this is, but this is a picture of the, all these variables. Here's the importance of class. It's very, the length of the vector is an index of how significant it is. It hardly matters for these. It's not significant for the upstream subox. Class meaning, meaning economic class. How well, we're asking them, does, does relative wealth or poverty matter much for your subak? These guys say no. Oops. These guys say yes very much. Class. In other words, this, the sharecroppers think that really matters in their case. Or here's the efficacy of shank sanctions. Here it works in an opposite way with class. It's essentially meaningless. Over here it's tightly coupled to the presence of class divisions. So we're seeing different dynamics between these groups. Okay? That was the math, or most of it. Um, so if we average those results out, boil this down to a two-dimensional model of, of these two groups, what we find is here are two clusters. These are the upstream, excuse me, the downstream subox who are not getting along very well. Here are the upstream subox who get along very well indeed. This is the average of the values of their responses to our subox. So they're close to perfection. Those guys, the downstream guys, are in effect muddling through. Now the question we are interested in is, is there a transition path between them? What leads the subak to go from one state to the other? Uh, is Su An, you want to raise your hand? Su An Chong proposed an answer to that idea about a year ago that we've been pursuing. He is a physicist, and so the idea was to borrow an idea from quantum mechanics to look at, to imagine that there is an energy landscape. I may have to defer to Su An in a minute to see if we can explain this, and ask, what does it take to move in this landscape, imagine uh, the transition path is essentially the covariance matrix, which has some curvature to it. The, the upstream subox are very similar. Downstream subox are a little more diverse in their 
uh, responses to our questions. But what we can do is ask, what is the, what is the, the minimum energy path in physics? It means what is the, the easiest path, essentially, to get from one state to the other? Which variables would dominate that pathway if, in fact, the Subox, hypothetical Subox might follow it? All right, so we find the local minima for those two wells, those two, those two states, and then ask what's going on in a hypothetical transition from one to the next. All right, so both of them, we think, are relatively stable conditions. The upstream sumox in particular are very stable. The downstream are a little less stable. So if we want, we can pick this up by exposing the questions exactly what that means. Um, what we find is that the transition path between these two groups is dominated by two things, by the efficacy of sanctions and by the, their ability to mobilize labor. I've worked for years among the Subox, but I probably couldn't have guessed accurately, nor could the farmers, you know, what those variables might have been. So this was just interesting results. And we decided to follow it up. So we looked at another 17 Subox, added a few more questions, and found essentially the same pattern. We find a kind of a deep well of happiness here, many Subox which are clustered together in a state that's, you know, they're much more content with their state. And then over here, we find the ones that are outliers. They don't form one. They actually, in the end, we've just discovered yesterday, form probably three different wells, right? And so the question is, what are the transitions that might lead from one state to the next? And I haven't got the slides because we just did this. It's just, we've just got these results. But we can, um, in principle, we can ask that question. Now, the interesting thing about this is these are simple surveys. Out from out of these surveys, out pops a hypothesis, right? about a transition path, which can then be tested, which can then be followed up. I gave this talk, I don't know, about a year ago, and a guy from the Federal Reserve Bank in, in San Francisco, who's in charge of community development, said, maybe this is the lens we need. He makes investments in communities, and he wants to know, you know, what are the consequences. You can do simple statistics on that, right? That's what he does. But you might also ask, can we get, it, can we get any deeper, right? Can we actually get some hypothesis from the data about what might dominate the transition path if there is one between them. We'd have to be very lucky to catch a Subak in the midst of a transition, but we can hypothesize what that transition might be. Okay. So, um, all right, so we think we've got some kind of handle on the dynamics of cooperation within Subox. But a further question emerges, which is, I've been pointing out that there are lots of these Subox, right? And along a river, there may be, in the case that we just saw, about 30. In some cases, they're more than that. So are the Subox actually 76. autonomous? The Green Revolution had just begun. The Green Revolution means the introduction of Western farming techniques, basically. It's high-yielding plants that are designed to grow quickly, along with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So this came as a package to the Balinese farmers. The farmers were told, in the interests of national development, take this new rice and plant just as fast as you can. If you can get three crops a year, great. Some of the old people said, well, the trouble with that is, According to our traditional system, we, we schedule, you know, we carefully time when the water goes into the fields and when it doesn't, and it has their reasons for that. After a couple of years of bumper harvest, those reasons started to become clear. Stephen Lansing's old friend, Wayan Pege, is a farmer in Sebatu. He remembers what it was like 20 years ago when the pests began to appear. The Green Revolution remedy for pests was pesticides. It's not just that the farmers were advised to use pesticides. They were forced to use pesticides. They would, they would be punished by the government if they didn't, because the government would say, if anybody doesn't use pesticides immediately, as soon as any sign of pests appear, then the pests will spread to other fields. So within a year or two, even the farmers you know, pumping these pesticides into their fields couldn't kill all the pests. The government then began to fly the island dropping pesticides from airplanes, and they succeeded in killing damn near everything. He says that everything is made by a creator, and so uh, by disturbing anything, by killing anything, you're, you're disturbing part of the creation, so you need to pay attention to the whole picture. Essentially, he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole picture. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
And that, Stephen told me, was the role of the water temple. Looking at the whole picture, applying wisdom accumulated over centuries. In the middle courtyard of the temple, the farmers gather every month. They make decisions in a democratic assembly on how they're going to plant. So in brief, the way this works is, here's our subak, we're A. We share the water from that weir with B. We have a water temple here that we both jointly maintain. And then up here is C. And the amount of water that they release based upon their cropping pattern influences the flow down to our weir. So we coordinate with them. And that system scales all the way up. It basically creates a network of control that extends over the entire watershed. Perfectly straightforward. A little hard to miss if you're thinking about it, but if you are an irrigation engineer trying to understand it, it the technique of management consists of a few old guys in white carrying a vial of holy water, sprinkling water on the field. Right? It doesn't look like a management system. So, okay. so anyway, they coordinate with their other with the other subox, uh, and the ritual timing of irrigation systems by the subox is how this system is controlled, both pests and the water. Water sharing and pest, pest control are two opposing constraints, okay? So here's the ritual sequence, a diagram by Julia Watson, who will be talking about the UNESCO World Heritage in Bali later on. I think this afternoon, right, Julia? All right. Tomorrow, okay. All right, so what does this actually do? Are there local to global effects? If everybody, if each water temple is managing its old system, does there, is its own system, does there need to be some sort of global system coordinating over dozens or perhaps hundreds of suwaks? So we built a simulation model, you'd not be surprised to find, to, to find out whether the global system could produce a global optimum. Here's how it works. Here we've got two rivers. Each of those little tiny squares is a suwak, so it's 142 suwaks from the mountains to the sea. Here are some of the water temples, okay, along the way. And the question is, if each of them then coordinates with its neighbors, does a global attractor emerge? To find out, we modeled the system. In this picture, what you see is each of these little symbols, like a star, indicates an annual cropping pattern. So they decide on what they're going to plant and when they're going to plant it, perhaps plant rice in July and October, something like that, right? So this is just randomized by the computer. Then we simulate a year, which means we simulate water flowing, irrigation flows, rice growth, pest damage. We simulate the whole ecological system. And then at the end of the year, we, com we have each subak compare its harvest with those of its neighbors, okay, in the system. Um, and then we add one little simple rule. If any of your neighbors did better, then copy what they did. If you did best in this little group, then do the same thing you did for the next year. All right, so that's the algorithm. And here's what happens. Here's the first year. You'll notice that the, if you can see them, the little symbols are chaotic. There's no pattern to them. Average harvest is less than five tons per year. That's no good. And um, there's no pattern to it. Explosions of pests are happening in those fields. By 10 years through this algorithm, it's called a hill climber, just you know, gradually incrementally achieving a synchronization. Harvest yields nearly double, and you see patterns emerging. These are networks that are doing the same thing, large enough to share the water and control the pests in each region. And then finally, here is the pattern of the actual water temple networks. If you're close enough, you can see that it is almost identical to the one we just grew in the computer. So it turns out that growing water temple networks is not only easy to do, it is inevitable. As long as we give this system biologically plausible values, water temple networks will emerge, and they will emerge quickly. So I think I'm going to skip over this. Well, maybe just say one of the reasons why we think cooperation fails in any system is the disparity of benefits. You're doing a little better than I am. I envy you. But if everybody's doing the same, if we ask people, compare your own harvest to the average in your subak, not only are you doing well, but you're all doing equally well, there's no reason for envy. And so this you know, adds to the possibility that this will be a stable system. I'm going to run out of time, so I'll just skip the details of that model. Just say it does, in fact, create a global optimal solution for irrigation flows and for rice growth in, along these rivers. Okay, so 
what we've just seen is, yeah, sumox are not autonomous. From the pest water dynamics, from the biophysical system, a single attractor emerges for a pattern of organization. And what that does is set the stage for the ongoing struggle to maintain cooperation, to continue to make this work in each subak. If the subak stops cooperating, nature punishes them pretty quickly, which is why we think this system works so well. Right? Rice dynamics are, it's fast ecology. Okay, so what happens is in our model, it settles down into two basins of attraction. Most of them are doing just fine. Some of them drift out of doing just fine. It is hard work to maintain these subox, and so it's not surprising that from time to time, things simply don't work, okay? So, question, is there any other evidence that this is actually how things work? Because our model is quite simple. Well, remember the Green Revolution. You just saw a little clip about that, in which everybody was told to plant as fast as possible and to ignore the temple system. That, in effect, was a, a real-world experiment in the efficacy of the water temple networks. It took them offline, right? They were no longer allowed. So it, you, can, it, you can duplicate this by running our simulation model in reverse. If you do that, you create chaos. It's, it's, it's deconstructing a water temple network. That's what the Green Revolution did, not because the guys who were in charge wanted to destroy the water temples. They simply had no idea. They did not recognize this system for what it was. And that's the real point here. Pest explosions, chaos and irrigation. Uh, and in the end, the Asian Development Bank recognized that uh, they'd made a terrible mistake. So we made a movie about this, which they actually show now to train their ear engineers on why the Balinese system works as it does. So, so I've got another minute or two. I'll just say, well, we'll see if we get to Borneo. One of the larger points, well, I'm talking about transitions between low dimensional islands of order, right? Stable or unstable states of the subox, which are not detectable, those differences, under the assumption of perfect equilibrium. They're all low dimensional islands of order. Probably, our guess is, you know, point attractors, equilibrium conditions are rare in the social world, and we just haven't seen them because we didn't know how to look <coughs> for them, just as we didn't know how to look for the Balinese water temple system. We don't, know, we don't notice them. We do not notice these low dimensional attractors because they look like noise. They look like noise in a conventional statistical analysis. Um, I've got another two minutes, right? So the story almost is finished here. Functional role of the water temples was invisible, but that's actually still, a, there's still a problem. Once the government the understood this, they allowed the water temples to regain control. But the Green Revolution still lingers. To this day, farmers add chemical fertilizer to this ancient, self-sustaining system. For the last 30 years, the farmers have been borrowing money from the village cooperatives to buy fertilizer that they don't need, applying it to the fields, it washes out of the fields immediately, flows back into the rivers and down to the sea, this little stream is flowing right out of those rice paddies up there. And as it comes down, it's of course carrying all the mineral nutrients from the volcanic soil, plus all that fertilizer. I mean, all the fertilizer that wasn't needed by the farms and is just washing down. So by the time it gets here, the sea, it's like a thin nutrient soup. And so the effect is you grow simple organisms like algae, the algae that you see growing along the rocks there. And that's what we find offshore, just blanketing the coral reefs. And we only find it in places like this, where you've got that kind of agricultural drainage. On the rest of the island, if there's no river carrying fertilizer, then the reefs are fine. But out there, the reefs are nearly dead. I'll just cut this short, so this problem, now con this problem continues. We take samples of the coral, and you can actually see the night, you can see the, the green revolution happening in the composition of the coral because you can do a stable nitrogen isotope comparison. Where is the nitrogen coming from that's growing the algae that's killing the coral? And three guesses, it's urea fertilizer, right? So, and you'll still, if you go to Bali, you can go snorkeling and you'll see this change. So we, these are important mistakes. And if I've got one more minute. That's really the last one, and it's okay, a minute. Okay, the very last one more minute. I just it's a minute, you've taken, you, uh, you, you have a system in there, eh? I do have a system. <laughs> Well, I'll invoke this because it's easy to get lost in the details of the Balinese example. And um, 
Julia will talk about the Balinese examples. We'll actually get back to Bali. I want to say just a word about Borneo, and it'll have to be just a word because the parallel is so exact. This is work by Julia Watts, uh, Julia, excuse me, Lisa Curran, ecologist at Stanford studying the dipterocarp forests of Borneo. We knew that the El Nino oscillation, you know, governed the climate system out here. We didn't know that the trees, these 470 species of dipterocarp, um, use ENSO as a signal to have a mast. A mast is when you drop your fruits and seeds. Okay, so a synchronized mast in Borneo. Um, and in that mast, there's no fruits or seeds for the predators to eat. This creates a gigantic pulse of food only during irregular El Nino years in Borneo. It's just like the Balinese water temples. It's the same technique for controlling predators, only the trees discovered it, okay? The problem is this was not noticed, this, this phenomenon was not noticed at the time that they were creating plans for the management of the forest, forest reserves, and so consequently, Lisa did experiments and discovered, in fact, the dipterocarps cannot reproduce. They become dead men standing. So what happens now is INSO triggers not regeneration of the forest but fires. Indonesia is now the third largest carbon emitter on the planet. After China and America, it's not because of their motorcycles, it's because of their burning the forest, which is what we breathe here. And maybe I'll just end with that, okay? Thank you very much, Steve Lanzer. <laughs> Stay here, please. Stay here, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's ask some questions, but uh, clearing up and give some remarks on uh, what Steve Lansing was presenting to us. Please, tell your name and then uh, th that might help. Uh, who, who's in the mic business? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you. Uh, Guanyin from NTU. Um, I wanted to link this to the topic of the workshop, which is governance. Uh, you said the Balinese system has been existing for about a thousand over about years. Thousand. Yeah. And what is it in the governance or lack of governance or whichever you want to call the governance that allows it to be sustained this long? And how robust is the governance system to shocks like the ones that you mentioned about the Green Revolution and so on? You know, so the, the Silox are an interesting case because I, they have to cooperate at a very high level but nature responds to failures in cooperation very quickly, and they're vital. If, if, if you're a rice, traditional rice farmers in Bali, that's the sustenance of your family. So there's a built-in mechanism for a very rapid response. And we think over time that allows this very high level of cooperation to be sustained. And in fact, it has been sustained, and we can look at the, uh, there are royal inscriptions dating from the ninth century, so you can actually track this process among other ways of looking at, we look at the stability of the communities. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a special case in that sense, right? In the, in the sense that the ecological dynamics reward cooperation, reward a very high level of cooperation. Um, what the threat to the continued existing, existence of this system now is exogenous. It's the uh, enormous influx of tourism and globalization which is leading to the loss of about a thousand hectares of rice terraces per year now. So there is a governance crisis, and in fact, I have to, okay. So Julia and I are working on the creation, UNESCO has now designated the Subox and Water Temples a World Heritage Site, a cultural World Heritage Site. And what we hope to do is two things. One is to help preserve the Subox for their own sake, right? But the second thing is, we think it's a very interesting example of a functioning complex adaptive system. We want people to go into visitor gateways that Julia will describe, come out of it and realize where they are, see something of what I've just told you, hopefully more, and that we hope with over, it's like three million visitors a year to Bali, we hope people will begin to see, you know, to, re to hear, here's a real world example that you would otherwise miss, see those dynamics, then go home and think about what else might work like this, right? We, we, okay. I'm talking too long. That's no, no, you're not, not talking about that. Sin. Please, go ahead, yeah, you there, yeah. Oh, you need a mic. I'm Suman Banerjee from NTU, and uh, thanks for this enlightening talk. See, it seems to me that you have talked about governance and supply side problems, but the demand side is also an issue because we have seen something. Subak is basically what is called Panchayati Raj in Indian system, you know, like the empowerment of the village, mm -hmm. and the village takes, at the smallest denomination, takes the decision. 
But the problem is when demands outstrip supply by n times, and n is a very large number, this excess demand starts playing and making all kinds of you know, uh, distortions. Now, necessarily, the way I understood your problem is that this system is possibly a low return, low variance system. Whereas, say, a uh, green revolution induced science genetically you know, induced system is a high return, high variance system. So there are more risk to the problems like pesticides, you know, and other other disasters associating. But in general, they on an average they produce more more grains. You know, that has to be true. Otherwise, it's kind of an inefficient system. So incorporating the demand side, that how you know the demand plays a role in this existence of this subak still. Uh, okay. would be an interesting okay. uh, aspect. So he's saying the Green Revolution is the best revolution you ever can have <laughs> because it's scientific, <laughs> and now and it's b because you get more yield. Uh, so what? So now we still have that problem. Now you have your subaks. What do you call them? Subaks. Subaks, and uh, you have a beautiful story on subaks. But what we need is a Green Revolution. When Norman Borlaug got the Nobel Peace Prize for the Green Revolution. Sometime in the 60s, he said that he would, he, they hoped that he could buy the world a generation's time to find an honorable equation between population growth and growth in the food supply, which he achieved. But the problem is massive doses of energy, which is what the Green Revolution works on, don't work in the long run. Soil fertility in Bali and all over the world, right, goes down. This has been extensively studied, not just in the Asian case, but also by Pam Madsen and Peter Batuzic in the homeland of the Green Revolution in Mexico. It's a short-term solution because nature is a little more complicated than that. Yes, you can pour on massive quantities of energy and change things temporarily, but nature is an interlocking, complicated system, so the long-term consequences are devastating. I mean, this system, Balinese Subox may or may not survive, right? If, if not, these rice terraces are very fragile. All these systems are fragile. So it's not that that, that was bad science, it's just that it was inadequate. I mean, it, we, we know more now, right, about how these things work. Yeah, but this is, I think, what you're saying here is, uh, I would say what I picked up here was, listen to me, he said, Steve Lansing, he said, when you look at this, these systems here, with your normal eyes, you would not find them. Right. And uh, certainly not with green revolution eyes. You would certainly not see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And you're blind for this kind of dynamics. And, uh, and even, uh, so there is a world going on which is not defined and not clarified. And now you're coming in with a total new system and you're making problems, that kind of thing. Now, this is what governance, governments are doing. Yeah. They like it. It's always coming from science and they say, listen, we have a new approach, mm -hmm. the best one. Mm -hmm. And now you are saying, well, if you have a new approach, I'm trying to summarize what you said. When you have a new approach coming from science, then you have to look in my way to these communities, how they are producing now, and how it can be fit to that system, which already exists, something li like that. And this is a way of complex re complexity research program uh, activities, which should be in the hands, it should be governed by government. It should be, I'm trying to, mm -hmm. something to, to pick up what you were saying. This is what I think you are saying. Listen, you don't see it, what's happening there. You're coming up with something totally new. You feel quite sure on that, and you don't see what's going on there. And, uh, and you can avoid these kind of problems by doing the kind of complexity research what we did, something like that. Please give a comment on that. Is that I, true? I'm going to move you just out of this picture. So here's Borneo, right? Which when I began, was an anthrop began my anthropology work, this was the highest biodiversity on the planet, and the seas around Indonesia have the highest marine biodiversity. So this is, these are the crown jewels of the planet. Heart of Borneo project is now dead. Most of the lowland forests of, of Borneo are gone. Fish stocks in the South China Sea are estimated to be between five and seven percent of their values around 1960. So there's a scramble to try to come up with governance solutions to this. Last week I spent a couple of days with David Carden, who's the American ambassador to ASEAN, and they are now trying to pull together right, some sort of international framework to begin to take action at the scale that is required. This requires, in, you know, what is the word, multilateral action. And I think our job is we just need to get better at the science. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. You know? we are, we are cha we're making changes at such a fantastically rapid rate. And the, I mean, the tools that we're talking about are new, right? 
complexity, 100 years, 100 years from now, we'll be better at the math. But uh, we haven't got 100 years, right? So we need to get busy. <laughs> yes? Oh. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I, I think part of the issue, at least it has been my observation, working with policymakers and government officials and even legislators, at least in the United States, is that I, I struggle with a group of individuals who may be very, very smart, but are scientifically illiterate. Mm. And there is no formal method for scientists to translate into policy uh, implications, if you will. And, and any ideas that you have on how to, how to help policymakers understand the concepts of complexity science because I can guarantee you they have no concept of what their policy implications are doing. Happily, the next speaker is Rob Axtell, who knows a lot about that. <laughs> I'm going to defer to Rob. <laughs> yeah, here was another one. Uh, well, it's, it, Jason Blackstock, UCL, it's, it's a follow-on question, which what? was, uh, the, the system that you've studied has been in a sort of dynamic stability for a thousand years, give or take. Yeah. And yet we're now dealing with systems that, that have at best stability uh, wells of five to ten years in some cases, mm -hmm. sometimes ten to twenty years. But we don't have how, I'd yeah, like yeah, you to yeah. just reflect on, on your methods and how, how you take some of the technical methods, the, the method you've used to study this system, and start to apply it in partnership with Policymakers in studying urban environments, for example, or take agricultural systems that are rapidly evolving in, in Western minds. How do you take these methodologies that you've applied to understand this and translate it into a faster, more robust system? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, really, the honest truth is it's early days, even for what I was just describing. Lock you and Lock you, where are you? Lock you, Chu and uh, Hendrik Santoso. These are the guys who are working on this problem here at NTU. We'll have a workshop organized by the Federal Reserve and the Aspen Institute sometime in the winter to begin to say what, you know, where can we go? Can these methods be applied more generally? So we're trying to do that. But again, I don't want to exaggerate how much we know, right? I mean, this is, in my mind, frankly, not really so much as an anthropologist, as someone who lives here, there is really, it, we really are in a race, right? The, the, the problems, a race of the time. A race with respect to the rate of anthropogenic change, the point that Peter Ho led with, you know, and ended with as well, that's real. And okay. uh, the, I, I, I was just saying with, to Rob actually earlier, we don't, you know, the idea that complexity has a magic decoder ring. No, but it's complexity is, research is that, uh, is that going to, okay, you get better results, better governance and government uh, uh, policy results, but it takes too much time. Is that what you you're a little bit afraid of? No, what I th no, what I claim is I think most social scientists who use standard methods, equilibrium methods, yeah. would agree that they are an abstraction and that w the world actually is nonlinear. The problem is we are just beginning to understand how nonlinear systems work, right? So we, it would be a mistake to exaggerate how much we know. I mean, it's just oh, beginning. Okay. Unfortunately. But are you saying then? When you are not going to do this kind of research, you policymakers, when you're not going to promote this, then you will come in bigger, bigger, bigger problems. Is that what you're saying? That's what because that's her question. Uh, how do you uh, are you going to say it to politicians and policymakers? How that's important what I it is. Say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but Jan, you, you wanted you wanted insights onto things yeah. that are important for this workshop that you're running. How many policymakers are going to be in the room? In other words, how do you actually do the co-production of knowledge with the policy community while you're developing exactly. your research methodologies? Exactly. So that's, that's one critical question for okay. the research agenda. That's one. It is an excellent question. Yeah, it's an uh, excellent You take that. <laughs> yes, there was, yeah, you, you were, yeah, you tried yeah. several times. Uh, Kevin Cole from NTU. Um, I'd like to contextualize um, uh, Steve Lansing's uh, sharing on, on Bali, which is a small island um, community, uh, and take a parallel to Singapore, which is a small city state, uh, and also the parallels on the demands of, of resources. Um, we see from the Subak uh, case 
that uh, there was a drive towards higher yield of uh, rice. In Singapore, we see a drive towards uh, more GDP and um, government's uh, outlook of it is towards growing our population. Um, what we've seen from the Bali case is the ecological damage that has happened from, call it the green revolution, modern science, yeah. And uh, for a local, for a Singaporean like myself, and also I think I speak for quite a few uh, locals, we see this um, impending uh, tragedy that could, that could evolve, this tipping point, ecological tipping point, that could evolve from our uh, deforestation that we see. Pockets of forest dotted all around of Singapore, which has made Singapore the beauty it is today, the garden it is today, that, has, you know, um, that has, uh, attracted many from around the world. But the locals who live around these forests that, that we've grown up with over 30 years, 40 years, you know, uh, we see it being chopped down uh, while government is saying we're replacing it now with modern new botanic gardens, artificial ones. And they forget that the ecology that has grown up next door to us where we live over 40 years is now going to be just um, substituted with something that uh, Techno nature. Techno nature, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm just, I'm just you want, to, you want to know what he thinks about it? Yes, and I just want to contextualize uh, uh, and challenge uh, perhaps uh, Steve to uh, be able to communicate um, what Bali has shown, what, what you, your study has shown, that sometimes our rapid drive towards um, economic goals, which are also, we are in a race. May, we may actually um, create more damage. Like what we see now to the corals around the downstream of those rivers, you see. Um, and it will be sad when we cross the tipping point and we lose the beauty that is Singapore today. Right now, we are, I think, around optimum. Yeah. If we continue to just build cut forests in the middle of our, you know, little pockets here and there that are already existing, the communities that have built, that have grown up around it, the children that have grown around it yeah. may find that Singapore is not so beautiful. Okay. I'll, move, I'll, I'll migrate out. Yeah. So that's what that's a fear here. But that I'm trying to protect to from him. Yes. Uh, how do we stop this roadblock? Okay. Stop that roadblock, see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to stop the roadblock because Hanawati Sudoyo, Indonesian geneticist, is going to talk about the consequences of the rapidity of change, the, the couple of interactions I'm talking about, that's a, a, an array of cases in Indonesia. And Julia's going to talk about landscape architecture and other array of cases, similar cases, analogous cases. And, I, and I, my serious point is, it's by examining those cases that we learn the consequences of a simplistic, top-down, engineered solution to managing the planet. It simply doesn't work. And so the way to get there, I think, the reason I'm giving you a specific example and why we need a lot of them is that that's what enables people to see them. The problem has been, my main theme here has been, they are invisible, right? What complexity allows us to see is these dynamics, which otherwise, from an engineering point of view, are just okay. They're noise. They're just noise. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve Hans. Thank you. Thanks a lot.